Hi there. It's very easy to make samples sound bad. I hear this regularly. Um, we're going to look at that today. We're not only going to look at how you make them sound good compared to how you make them sound bad. Um, we're also going to look at um, some case uh, ideas of how to make some, um, you know, samples sound epic or how to make them sound uh, intimate, um, how to get the depth in the orchestra um, and maybe a couple of unusual treatments at the end as well. So let's dive straight in. So first up, we've got a core anglais loaded up and I'm just going to play something and make it sound bad. There are four things you need to consider when you're playing something with a patch. You need to consider what the patch is designed to do. Um, you need to consider whether you're playing idiomatically. You need to consider your expressiveness, musicality of the phrase that you're playing. And then finally, you need to think about the instrument, how the player plays the instrument. In this case, breathing, things like that. So what we've got loaded up here is a legato patch. Um, it's obviously designed specifically for kind of lyrical playing. It's not designed to do staccatos. So that's going to sound terrible. If we switched over to staccato, that's going to sound better. So let's put it back on legato. Um, the other thing that I'm not doing, I'm not touching any of the controllers. And this is the absolute first golden rule is that you wiggle the controllers. Now you can see my hands moving here and you can see on the screen what I'm doing. The two controllers that I'm using here are dynamics and vibrato. So with the vibrato, non-vib, vib. The other consideration that you have with samples is that if you're using a solo instrument, there is going to be a point where you cross from non-vib to vib, um, where the developer will have tried as hard as they can to try and cover up the uh, movement between the two layers. It's going to have a slight discontinuity. So you have to be aware of that and you have to try and play sympathetically to that. So if, if I um, did this, that's not too bad, but it's kind of sounding, um, you can hear it. Actually, actually it's not too bad, but it, what, I'm trying to um, make it clear the difference between that and for example, this. Now what I'm doing there is um, I'm changing the vibrato as I'm changing the note. And that is going to help because it's going to give you that, um, you know, there's always a slight onset within the vibrato sample. The players um, don't r rarely, well, we certainly don't instruct them to come in just going, da, yeah, 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 because that's not musical. Um, so there's always a kind of slight onset of the vibrato. Bye, yeah, 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 yeah. You can hear it. So use that to your advantage. And um, this is always going to sound more musical if you can try and hide as many of the little little um, peculiarities of samples um, as you can. Right, the other controller, Modwheel, this controls the dynamics. So, and you can reassign this to anything. I mean, in the libraries, it's set to CC1, but you can reassign that to anything you want. Personally, I'll just leave it on CC1 because then it's con uh, consistent across all of the libraries. Um, and most other uh, developers use CC1 as well for their dynamics. So um, how do we use the dynamics? Well, let me just leave the vibrato at the top. If I play something like this. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? And the reason is that there's no musicality in the way that it's being played. So a player would probably on a core anglais, and this is where we look for the actual instrument, how the player plays the instrument. Um, they might try and creep in that top note. They would certainly wouldn't honk it like a like an upset duck. So let's pull the slider down. So we put a little bit of phrasing in there. I mean, there's it's an infinite thing, an infinite palette, and also the context will make sense in terms of what's going on around it in your production. But this slider, this um, dynamic slider is the absolute key to making stuff sound good. There may be, uh, so th this is always cross-fading between real recorded dynamic layers um, in, in these libraries. There are um, some libraries where there's only one layer, so you're, all, you, all it is really is a volume control. Um, and that's easier to make patches like that. It's easier to make samples like that because obviously you've got, you haven't got the problem of what's happening when you cross-fade between the layers. 
Um, if you have a listen to this, I'll do it really slowly to expose it as much as possible. Now you hear, you can, you can just about hear there's some changes there, but we've tried as hard as we can to hide those changes to make it easier for you to play. So there's no real terrible lumps and bumps for you to have to try and get over. Um, but using both of these controls together, you get a more kind of musical phrase. Um, Okay, so that's we've looked at that uh, on the cor anglais. Let's have a quick look at the flute. Again, uh, we can make this sound bad really easily. Um, down the bottom end of the flute is the kind of weakest part of it. It's the quietest part. So if you have other instruments playing, it's very easy for the flute to get drowned. And we're playing it and it sounds um, we've got the vibrato in there, so it doesn't it's not it doesn't sound horrendous, but there's no expression at all. We're not putting any expression in. Let's start putting some expression in. So here we're introducing some expression, some uh, <laughs> when I'm saying expression that's with a small e, so ex musical expression into the phrase um, by moving this dynamic slider, moving the vibrato occasionally, and trying to, make each part sound as musical as possible and it just makes a huge difference. Um, again, it doesn't sound great if you try and make it do things it can't do. Nothing happening if we switch to staccato. That's a really sharp, powerful staccato if you normal one. Then you get something more realistic. So again, it's about looking at the um, type of phrase that you're playing and trying to make the, uh, to, trying to pick the appropriate articulation within the library to make it sound good. Let's have a look at the bass clarinet. Okay, so a couple of different um, things there. Um, if we, let's load up an actual clarinet. There's a couple of things here as well that you uh, it's useful to know. I'll just put up a quick mix, including the close mic, so you can hear nice and clearly. Um, so with the clarinet, there are some notes that are harder to go to and from than others. So with the clarinet, the um, range of the bottom register, the Chalamet register, goes uh, all the way up to a written B flat, which is a B flat transposing instrument, so that's a sounding A flat. Now that um, then, when you go from that, which is basically two metal keys at the top with no holes, uh, to the next, let's say a tone up, that involves putting all of the fingers down. And while obviously a decent clarinetist can make that sound as seamless as possible, there is obviously um, f there is obviously a kind of uh, resistance of the air moving in the instrument to actually making that transition. And you can just hear that there. Um, it's a physical thing of the instrument. It's just one of those things in the same way that, you know, certain stretches aren't possible on the double bass and, and things like that. So these things are useful to know because it helps you to write uh, around them or at least to understand that, you know, um, that there are gonna be things on, on each individual instrument that are gonna sound a certain way because of the mechanics of the instrument. So here we've got a different example. So this is recorded in uh, Lindhurst Hall. So here we've got the Cor Anglais. Uh, let's put the ambient mics in as well. And then compared to our So you can clearly hear that the way that the instrument reacts in the space is very different. Um, everything is kind of magnified by that reverberation. So when you get key clicks and things like that, those all sound out and they are um, they they seem more intense and louder because they are bouncing around the hall. Now that's something that's interesting to look at. So what is what is the effect of us putting some different kind of reverb types on this? And also what mics should we use when we're going to 
add reverb to the sound. Let's start by just taking our tree mic, which sounds like this. And let's pop some reverb on it. Okay, so we've got a bit of TC Hall lined up. That sounds quite nice. Let's try changing the balance slightly. So we'll really give it some welly and pull the direct signal down a little bit. Okay, so that's quite interesting. Now, what, what changes happen if we change the microphone that we're using? Let's try close one. Okay, so there's less volume coming from that mic. It says it's obviously not a room sound, so it's a slightly different timbre coming out of there. Um, let's try compensating that by just turning it up a bit. Let's try the second close mic, which is a different sound. Interesting. Let's try the outriggers. So this is quite interesting. You're getting this sound. Let's go back to the tree. Now this is a sound that you'll kind of start to associate with these kind of um, epic uh, woodwind solos. I mean, if we get the flute and do exactly the same thing to the flute, So you're getting that that kind of um, really epic, beautiful, uh, big sound. And part of the reason for that, um, we did the same comparison. So let's just listen to the close mic on its own. Just turn it up a tiny bit. Interesting, but a very direct plus reverb kind of sound. That's a different sound. Why is that a different sound? Well, the answer is that you're getting something where you've taken the sound of a room and then you're putting that entire room into a re reverb treatment. This is a very specific sound. It's, it's what I'd refer to as a um, filmic sound. You're using the, the room, um, but what you don't have is what I'd call an overdub sound. And the overdub sound is when you do have a very dryly recorded um, instrument and then you just put a giant reverb on it. And that is much more like this kind of sound. And if we take that sound, we can obviously kind of pan it a little bit and maybe add a little bit of stereo width to give it a bit more of an extreme positioning. We can even go really overboard on the reverb, just push it right up. We can even take a more extreme reverb sound and put it through there. But we still have that sound, which is a close mic dry instrument being reverberated. And if we switch out the mics once more for a sound which has some room sound in, can you leave, leave a little bit of the close in? which is more of a kind of balanced studio stage sound. Then that gives you a really beautiful um, kind of feel to the sound. We can dial the length of the reverb back slightly and we can put in an echo either before or after the reverb. This is what it sounds like before. Let's put in a kind of standard kind of ping pong. So I've got one side doing eighths, one side doing quarter notes. And if you want to hear what that sounds like without the reverb, we 
can go back to our TC Hall. Okay, that sounds good. Um, let's put the Pro R back in and just see what it sounds like with the echo after the reverb. And that sounds quite interesting as well. You get you're getting that um, you're getting that extra kind of well. You're obviously multiplying the reverb as well as the signal. Um, let's just go back to our instrument and try just the close mic with both of these treatments. And switching them back again. And finally that close mic feeding into the TC Hall. So you can get the idea here, there's lots of different ways to take the signal, but it's important to, to use the correct signal for the kind of feel or effect that you want to achieve. It's very common for um, uh, recordings that have been made in a scoring stage, which tends to be on the drier side of things, to then have a reverb applied to them. So it's a kind of um, three stage process in a sense. It's the solo instrument itself. It's the sound of the quite tight and reasonably dry room that it's recorded in and then it's the sound on top of that of the uh of the kind of gloss reverb or whatever you want to call it which tends to be something like retrieving data interesting not quite sure what's going on there <laughs> um it tends to be something like a two i think i've got a 2.8 second uh, warm hall loaded up in the tc6000 it might be shorter, you might have a, you know, that might be too much for, for the um, sound of the score that you're making or the sound of the recording that you're making. But that is a very, very common sound. It's a very familiar sound that you'll have heard a lot. Here's a slightly different signal chain. So we've got a dimension D um, going into a phaser, going into the echo. So you can take this stuff, you can take these these um, kind of natural instruments and you can just do all kinds of crazy stuff with them. I mean, it, we, <laughs> if we go away from our kind of legato here and just pick the normal longs, let's put a bit of the room sound back in. Pretty cool sound, even the staccatos. You know, you, you can get some mad great stuff here. Um, the key thing for me always is that you've got a really great source, which is a really great organic musical um, sound that's full of life at the kind of origin of, of what you're trying to do. So we've talked about some of that stuff. The final thing to talk about is the kind of front to back. Now, um, you've got in here, in this studio recording, let's turn all this stuff off. In the studio recording, we stick with these stack, staccatissimo sounds. You've got two different close. Let's turn the reverb off. You've got two different close sounds. So that's one. Two, that's a kind of tighter, um, more mono sounding sound. You've got two different trees. So you can already hear that that's placed further into the room. And that's a different tree. So you've got one that's more directional and one that allows more of the room sound in. You've got your outriggers, which is a slightly wider room sound, and then ambient, which is the least defined sound, is the best way of putting it, the most distant sound. Obviously, in a in a scoring stage like this, there's not quite such a feeling of, of um, distance, as opposed to here, for example, where you've got the ambient mics, you've got a big hall, they're a long way away from the direct signal. You've got the tree again, slightly more direct, but still got that feeling of a big hall. And those close mics where you're right close up against the signal. So you can mix these according to taste and to get a feeling of the kind of space that you want to achieve.
And that is all about perspective and it's all about positioning from front to back. If we go back to our solo clarinet and we want to mimic that effect here, our first port of call beyond getting a mix up with the mic mixers is to look at the onboard reverb. So which helps you to kind of expand the space that you're looking at. But if you want to get a really very precise position in a space kind of effect and, and, you're, and you're going beyond the kind of normal layout and balance of what's happening, then the thing to pull up would be something like Altiverb, where you have the opportunity to position things in space. So let's just pull out the draw here. Now I'm going to turn off the tail so we just have the early reflections. And so because we're using the close mics here, we're limiting the existing early reflections already. Um, and we're going to impose some kind of fake early reflections on the sound. Um, and we can use the positioner to, to do this. So it just by default, you can hear it's in there. Um, if we want to position this closer or further away, we could put it all over one side, you know, right up close on one side, or looking down there. And then you can add the tail in. So you've got those options for actually positioning a sound very, very precisely into a space. Now, some of this stuff is going to be overkill, but it's useful to know how to do it when you really need to do it to get that effect. Personally, I find that the more you put your sounds through um, the, this kind of IR type treatment, um, there's a thing that builds up that doesn't sound pleasing to my ears. So I tend not to use this for loads and loads of stuff, but it's a great tool to have for a very specific effect when you want something uh, to come from over there. In my personal, um, my personal taste, I like to have the, the orchestra recorded in situ. I don't like recordings that are made from a kind of um, central position and then having to position every part of the orchestra. Because I think the more kind of stuff that you do like that, the more it degrades the uh, sound that you've got. So I hope some of that was useful. A quick look, first of all, at how to make samples sound bad, how to make them sound more musical, and then yeah, a couple of different treatments for um, specific effects. Thanks very much. See you on the next one.